Hey, so we're going to do a thing where we've never done before. Rockman and I have gone on many excellent adventure road trips. Yes, Hot Boy Summers. Hot Boy Summers. We've, uh, we've, uh, we're even Hot Boy Falls. Yeah. Where we've, uh, you know, followed around DMC on Record Store Day weekend, or we've uh, gone to every Walmart looking for amazing Christmas sweaters. America used to have some pretty righteous Christmas sweaters, but today we are on our way to a, a festival called Rock for a Cause. What is it? What is it Rock La Cause. Yeah. And some Rock really, the Cause. Some really cool bands are there, and with the imagination of a time I really appreciate, where you have like Arch Enemy as one of the headliners, but also Sublime with Rome. Like, this reminds me of the good old days where it's just like, fuck you, it's music. Yeah. And yeah. I think some 41 were supposed to be playing yeah, too. Yeah, they were supposed to be, I believe. But they never got a replacement for them, right? I don't know. No. It's hard to find replacements so, like within yeah. days. I know, I know. They, I mean, they offered it to the Rockman Power Hour, but we tried to explain to them we're, you know, we're not particularly a band. No. We're in bands. We were in oh, bands. But we're but not a band. We're not a band. Or are we? So we're going to talk about um, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. But I think we'll start off with talking about Oceaga. Okay, so Eventco and uh, Oceaga, they've been doing this thing forever. Right. Uh, I go and I see, for the first time in a few years, something that's kind of like what I consider out of the Eventco box, if Heavy MTL would have still existed, Pumpkins and Green Day or 77. Right. Most likely they would have based an event around that. Right. Uh, but here they are at, uh, here they are at Oceaga, and the interesting thing to me is I go outside and the blazing sun feeling like a uh, like an ant underneath a magnifying glass and watching the good old boys and rancid rock out some tunes that are about 30 years old now right and uh i see a bunch of moms or older moms let's say you know there's some very good looking ladies in their 40s yeah all singing obscure rancid songs it was the hottest thing i've ever seen right and uh, <laughs> but i also saw half the crowd being kind of like the right. hell is this right so but then I remind. Then I think back, and I'm like, no, Oceaga kind of always been. Has it's been, always been eclectic. Is a mixed bag, and yeah. you were mentioning to me the first Oceaga you saw possibly would have been when Iggy Pop was there, and I'm like, fuck right, Iggy Pop. That's true. It's not a predominantly pop festival. No. It's kind of an alternative festival. So that, now I want to ask you. I'm like, take me back to the first Oceaga you went to, because I've only stepped foot in there maybe three years now. I uh, think it was. I think it was. Fuck, I think it was the Iggy Pop year where he played with the Stooges, where it was like a bunch of the original members. Okay. Um, including that guitar player that passed away shortly after. Shortly after? Yeah, like Fuck. I think a couple of months later. Um, but yeah, no, Oceaga's, I can't remember the first first one I went to. I think that might have been it, but I mean, I've been going for, I really started going once I got, you know, once I started working in radio. So definitely least 12 of the last 14 years or yeah because there was a couple years where they didn't have it um but you know i've been a lot and it's always been eclectic there's always been you know i've seen new order i've seen jesus yeah new order played i've seen um I mean, i've seen a lot of bands that look offspring played oish the doctor that was jagger um, no that was heavy right or I 77 think. i can't remember but i know that new order played it have it no offspring played heavy yeah so yeah. new orders played it um Obviously, M and M's played it. Well, Foo um, Fighters, I think, were supposed to Foo play Fighters it. Foo Fighters were supposed to play it. That didn't DC happen. Boys were supposed to play it. Um, M M but yeah. then, but then, uh, MCA got sick. M yeah, MCA passed away. Actually, well, he got sick and passed away. Right. And uh, yeah, 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 it's got upgraded to uh, the headliner that year because it was just such a short-term right. like right. cancellation. But I mean, I've seen it's always eclectic. Like I've seen, there's always a handful of bands that really speak to like 90s people you yeah know? even 80s sometimes of course um so it's always and i think this year more than ever was a really um was a really rock year which was surprising 
you know, like with Smashing Pumpkins, Green Day, and Rancid. Well, that's the Saturday, but what about yeah. the Friday and the Sunday? Friday I, and Sunday very, was very skewed, very young. But, yeah. I mean, it's I think what's smart about them is that they don't... The reason why the event stays as relevant as it, as it does is because they're always looking for what's on the cutting edge and what's new. And I think that's the only way you're going to keep your festival alive. I agree. Like, if you called your festival Hill to Die On... Right. Uh, then you would, you know, you, like... You have a certain amount of people you'll hit. Yeah. And only a certain amount of acts that you could fill that space in. And any rock and roll festival, you know, like, Oceaga is a, you know, it's it's a mixed bag of everything. You know, they always have yeah. good hip-hop. They've got good indie. I mean, Emil and the Sniffers, that band is, like, totally popping right now. And, you know, they were playing on the other side of the uh, of the stage, like the other side of the, yeah. of the side, and they were great. They were super, super good. But a lot of people... You know, a lot of the times on the green stages, like on the on the other side of the site, that's where a lot of the magic happens. And for me, you know, I've seen the breeders on that side. I saw Tricky on that side. I've seen some really, really good shows on that side of the site, not even on the main stages. So it's a mixed bag. It really is. And I always discover a couple of bands that blow me away. And this year was all about that discovery, too. Yeah. Sure. So it's important, like you were mentioning on social media, it's super important to you that... Uh, here you are, like not affiliated with Bell anymore. You were here strictly as the Rockman Power Hour, yeah, yeah. And and you know, you, and you did your thing. You were interviewing up and coming artists, and yeah, I think our, our our goal was to to talk to as many people as we could that were not necessarily, you know, bands that everybody was shooting for, mm -hmm. but bands that were a that were willing to talk. Because you know, let's face it, when you're young and you're hungry, you're a lot more willing to to do interviews than if you're established and you don't have to. But um, but I think everybody's always going for those headliners. And for us, we were like, let's just talk to, let's put our, our name on the press list and let's go there and interview bands. Like, you know, up and comers, that, that, like we would for the podcast. Like, and talk to them because we're interested and listen to the music and go, you know what? I like that artist. Let's shine some light on them. Yeah, like Scene Queen is awesome. Yeah. I started following her on Instagram and every She's time great. I hear something, I'm just like, you know, this is a very well-crafted either punk song or yep. like... Uh, rap rock song or whatever just you know I know her influences because she was on the show but it's it's really cool how it's all mixed together oh and Mannequin Pussy too like that yeah. was another band that played on the main stage that I would have gone to see any day of the week in a club mm -hmm. um, but I hadn't heard of really except you know what Oceaga does is they'll put out a lineup and when they do every year I'll go and I'll listen to the majority of it I'll go and I'll listen to a couple of songs and I'll discover stuff I like. And there's a couple of festivals that do that. There's them. Well, there's Pop Montreal that does it as well. And there's FM or, or FME, mm. which is that festival I go to every year in Buena Honda. And, I, and they're emerging music festivals. So they're really about being on the cutting edge. So I like that. I, to me, it's more, what's more exciting than discovering new music. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, back in the day, just to uh, pivot over to uh, an old festival, May it Rest in Peace, uh, the, the Warp Tour, right? Well, actually, no. Fuck that. The first first show, I, the first time I ever saw Green Day, yep. ironically, it was also at Tron Trapeau, but it was in 1998. Right. And this is uh, Edge Fest. Yep. We played on that Edge Fest. Wow. Slaves on Dope played in a tent on that Edge Fest. It was right before we moved to LA. Crazy. I remember man. it was. I, I remember the Foo Fighters played as well. I think. I have no idea. Yeah, Foo Green, Fighters Green played. Green Day Green were Day. even in the middle of the day. They weren't even that late. And yeah. I, I know. And Green Day. I think Moist were going on after. Yeah, uh, and, Moist were there that day. And Carnal I think, and Crush and yeah, uh, and I yeah. think Moist were going on after Green Day, and Green Day had lit their drum kit on fire. Yeah, and it was an issue for them to go on stage after. And uh, Green Day weren't even headlining. Yeah, yeah, Beth Naked was there too, yeah. I believe, and Creed. It's uh, weird how I remember all this shit. But I know, but, but I know the Foo Fighters were there. But you know, like when you're you do something so much, it's not that you're jaded, but it's just yeah there's a part of you that can kind of coast because you're not really learning anything new when you're thir fucking 13 years old and this is one of the first concerts you're at without your parents you are scanning everything like the terminator yeah <laughs> like even the lineup process i remember distinctly this guy my childhood friend phil germain shout out to phil we went to the show together we got into green day essentially around the same time about 94 95 and uh I remember we met a band in line who were selling their own CDs. Right. And they were called, oh, fucking hell. I remember his name was Yuri. Okay. 
And uh, I, for some reason, the second I started saying all this, the name dropped from my fucking memory, but it's been there for years. Either way, we bought his CD and we made connections. It was the first time we ever really met a guy in a band. Okay. And we are like, oh shit, that can happen. We we're, we're thought bands were unapproachable beings from the stars that would only like beam down to play a concert and then mysteriously disappear in a cloud of mist. Right. What was a band like that when you were growing up that uh, you met? Like a, one of the first bands you ever actually met? Um, Local. Well, I remember meeting... Um, I remember meeting this band, 13 Engines, that we played with that were... I think they were... I don't know if they were local, but local band. Um, I remember meeting Atomic Folk, like bands that we we started with on the scene. Me, Mama Morientaler some of those bands and they were like bands that were like starting to get popular and it was like wow you know oh, yeah. like these guys these guys are bands that are you know that are doing stuff and they're playing shows and but I remember I remember playing live music like the first bands I played in were like in 91 92 so it was really at an interesting time in music like when yeah. you know, Smashing Pumpkins uh, had put out their first album and you couldn't buy it in Canada it was only available on import so I had to I had a special order from Cheap Thrills from Caroline Records and it took like six weeks to arrive. Jesus. I yep. remember that and I think that was 91 or 92 and then I remember when Pearl Jam put out 10 uh, Blood Sugar Sex Magic from the Chili Peppers like all that was like early 92 I think or 91 like late 91 early 92 early 92. Yeah. And I remember that like as clear as day because it was such an influential time and I was playing in my first band Destiny's Daughter but I remember you know going to Station 10 and um, there were all these bands that we would we, we played with when we first first started that I thought was so cool it was like um, you know local bands and, and bands that were maybe touring maybe from Ontario but like they were like I, I just remember 13 Engines because they were like one of the first bands that we we played with we got added on we were the first of uh, we, were the, we were only support and it was that um, this bar called Gertz. Yeah. Was that at Gertz? Well, was it? No, it was at, it was at McGill. So it was where McGill used to do their shows at the, um, now it's called the Shatner Theater, but it was on, <laughs> yeah, but it was in, on McTavish, I think. That's, um, I remember, I remember a scene. I remember being in the punk scene and the idea of here's your friends and we're all starting bands and we're friends because we're all in bands and if we go see each other's shows, all of a sudden there's a crowd. Right. Because if you're friends for four bands and there's four members per, right. all of a sudden the room starts filling up. And then there's this idea of kind of like, but we all love, fell in love with the the idea of the Gilman Street scene that Green Day and Rancid and Operation Ivy all came from. Sure, of course. Yeah, like the idea of having a scene and like, yeah. and, and there were some bands that in our, in our when we were coming up that was it was kind of like a scene. Yeah. But I remember the band that left the biggest impression on me when we started touring and playing outside of Montreal. We played with this band in Thunder Bay called Trigger Happy. Okay. And they were this punk band from Toronto, and they were just fucking amazing. And they had this na singer named Al Nolan, and the lead singer, he was just amazing. Like, incredible front man, great singer. Like, you know, not, not a great vocalist, necessarily, but... Yeah. Um, like it's not like his, he had these like incredible vocal chops, but when he was on stage, like he was just a great front man. And I remember I would get a lot of comparisons to him. And I remember when I met him, he, I remember him coming up to me going, uh, there's a rumor going around. You're trying to steal my gig. And he was kind of joking, you know, mm -hmm. and I was kind of like mortified. I'm like, why would I want to steal your gig? I didn't really get it, but we ended up doing some shows with them. And, um, I thought they were just the fucking coolest band ever. They were called Trigger Happy. Was he committed to shaving his head back then as much as you were? No, no, he had a. <laughs> no, he was. He, he was just like they were. They were a really, really cool band. They were a really cool band, and I remember they did a lot of opening slots for a lot of punk bands, like a lot of those '90s, you know, um, all those bands that were on those labels that everybody liked back in the '90s. Mm -hmm. um, was it Strung Out or not Strung? Uh, well, bands like Strung Out. And, Bands like Lagwagon and all those like 90s. Yeah, um, those fat rack epitaph bands. Exactly. Well, all epitaph was also this idea, like right. you look at this time of period and you're like, so let me get this straight. All the band, Brett, Brett, Brett Gerowitz of Bad Religion starts a record label and the first four bands he signs are Bad Religion, of course. Yeah. No Effects, The Offspring, 
Rancid and Pennywise, yeah. like f- the first five bands. You get track, right? And you're like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. No, there was something in the water, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Like all these bands would sell millions and millions of records once the the punk bo- uh, punk boom happened, and uh, after Green Day hit it big, Green Day and Green Day and Offspring. But of course, thing is, we, we we came up in that time, but we never fit with any of those bands. Like we didn't. We didn't have anything to do with any of that scene in term musically. Gotcha. Um, but we ended up playing with, you know, a lot of bands. Like back then, they would just put anybody together because it's like, well, you guys kind of like are heavy. But we didn't make any fucking sense to tour with any of those punk bands. But Trigger Happy did. They were really part of that scene. They were a, a real punk band. But yeah. I just remember their energy was just so fucking infectious. Yeah, but how boring is it really when you see a show and every band plays the same fucking tempo, like? It is kind of lame. Like, The Offspring always kind of took risks with their opening acts and stuff. Yeah. Like, I saw... And, you know, I, I will... Full disclosure, I'm, The Offspring had two opening acts. One of them was The Living End, which were astounding from the yeah. Australia. They're like, you know, Stray Cats meets The Clash meets Green Day. Just fucking an incredible band. And then after them was this other band that did a bunch of different styles and stuff and my 14 year old ass just wasn't having any of it right because i you know when your brain is building and you're just trying to craft an identity and you find your identity in music or the clothes you wear because you haven't figured out who you are when you strip it all away like i i say this all the time on the show i'm like i was a little fucking poser dickhead so to go back in time i wish i could just say just pay attention there this Offspring even having them here just yeah. means that Offspring wants your brain to be bigger. Yeah, well, it's like, yeah. you know, whenever Faith No More would bring an opener or Mr. Bungle would have a band with them, you'd be like, they'd always bring really, really interesting bands on tour with them. Yeah. Because they would bring out who they who they liked, who they enjoyed. Yeah. And that's, that's a nice thing to have, like, when you can bring a band out that you're like, oh, no, I like this band. I want to bring them on, on tour. Like, I remember Slaves on Dope brought out Drowning Pool their first U.S. tour was with us. And um, they ended up having that Let the Bodies Hit the Floor song, and it's so fucking big. Yeah. And I remember their song, their singer Dave Williams was just such a nice guy. Such a nice guy. Yeah. And um, and I remember we were, like, really proud that we, we had this band out. But again, Slaves on Dope Curse, we would fucking have these bands open for us, and they'd just become fucking huge. Or we'd play with these bands, and they just, like, it was like being on a landing, you know, like on a, a tarmac and you just be jets like betting, getting ready to take off and you see these bands well that's how the Ramones felt just but then again when we all kill to be the Ramones like yeah you know. well it's just funny how that happens in, in music you know yeah well the Blondie all these bands I use like Ramones besides television Ramones are like one of the first bands to play CBGBs yeah I think television were the first one but, uh, you know, I don't know offhand but it oh, sounds about right television now. Talking Heads they all come yeah. from that CBGB scene yeah but all these bands, uh, even White Zombie, like they used to open up for Ramones. Well, uh, actually, White Zombie in turn, when they got popular, they took out the Ramones. Well, you know, who used to bring everybody out at the beginning was Motorhead. Yeah. Motorhead brought everybody out. Yeah. They, they were like notorious for bringing everybody out. Pre- Judas Priest too. Yeah. Judas Priest would bring out all new acts. Well, you heard the Dimebag story, right? Which one? Well, uh, Rob Halford, this is around the Painkiller album. Yep. And he's watch. He's in Canada, and he's watching fucking Much Music or Music Plus, one of the two. Yeah. And Dimebag's being interviewed, and he's wearing a uh, Judas Priest T-shirt. Yeah. And he's like, "Oh, whoa, these guys are great." Calls up, finds out who their management is, brings them out, brings them out on tour as an opening act. And uh, I believe Dimebag Daryl was buried with his Judas Priest vinyls. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, yeah. I, I. So going back to Dave Williams from Drowning Pool, they were from Texas. And I remember when we played with Drowning Pool, when they played with us in Texas, uh, Dimebag came to the show. Because he used to call, they used to have a nickname for Dave and they called him Stage. Okay. Because he was such a front man. And Dime, oh. Dime came to the show and that was the, that was the night where, well, that story where I told you how I got the shot glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the Jägermeister shot glass, but he, um, he had oh, a tattoo. Oh, you might as well tell it right now. Well, it's just, well, when I saw Dime, because I knew Dime from Ozfest, yeah, and um, we had a very interesting history with Pantera because our manager knew this woman named Jennifer, 
who worked for uh, Sharon and Ozzy, and she was a huge, huge Pantera fan and friends with the guys. And she was the one that helped get Pantera on OzFest the year we were on. And our manager, because we were so close to Sharon, because um, she was our label head, had said something about the Pantera guys being rednecks and a bit racist. Okay. Um, she goes, yeah, well, those guys are a bunch of good old boy racists. And, and I remember we went up to um, Dimebag backstage at, on one of the first audit fests, and we were like, hey, it's so nice to meet you. We're from Slaves on Dope, and oh, like, we're, we're big, big fans. And, and, and I remember Dimebag looked at us and goes, oh, you guys are the ones, you guys are the ones whose manager thinks we're a bunch of fucking racists. And I remember we were just like, Ugh. and we were just like, our tongues were tied, and we didn't know what to say, you know? Yeah. Um, but then after he, he was fine with us and, and everything, and I guess he had heard something from, from their, you know, from through that conversation of our old manager, Alex, who ended up turning out to be a piece of shit who fucking robbed us. Um, it's interesting though, that, uh, he heard this pre-internet. Like, yeah, no, 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 he heard like, you know, there was some, anyways. <laughs> who knows, who knows what kind of version he heard well, based on his yeah. like, slaves, uh, their manager thinks you're racist, purple monkey dishwasher. Right, <laughs> but we ended up yeah. we ended up, you know, seeing the Pantera guys all the time, and it was fine. But, but I remember we saw him again when we played in Texas, and he ended up coming to the show. And I remember he had shorts on. He always had shorts on, and he had a new tattoo. I said, "Oh, you got a new tattoo?" And he said, "Yeah." And he pulled it up, and it was like the Halford logo from that Halford album that he put out. Um, he had this solo album that he put out that was just fucking amazing. Yeah, and it was and it was when he wasn't playing with Priest anymore. And um, it was just so fucking cool because he was a big Priest fan. And that was the night that we went into the limo and um, he was, I was in a limo with a couple other people and... Um, like Vinny's limo? Uh, Dimebag's limo. Okay, sure. And they were passing out shots and he passed me a shot and they were on Jägermeister in these Jägermeister Pantera shot glasses. And I said, no thanks. And he's like, do a shot. And I'm like, I don't drink. He's like, you don't want to do a shot with fucking Dimebag? I'm like no, I don't want to do a shot with Dimebag. I, I don't drink. And so he fucking grabbed the shot and did it and then said, here, keep the glass. So I have the glass still. Good for you for, uh, that's why you have a 30-something, like, 32-year chip. Yeah. Because I would have sold out so fucking fast. Yeah, no, I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> I wasn't going to do a shot with Dimebag. I didn't really give a fuck about that. But I would but, do uh, a shot with Dimebag's ghost at this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but it was, um, yeah, I mean, going back to bands and, and taking bands out and all that I mean you know I think when you like a band and you're able you have the power to be able to bring them out because you think they're good that's that's a great thing and there's a lot of bands that do that there's a lot of bands that, that take that as a as a hey let's use this opportunity to give somebody a platform you know but not just that like I, I you, now when I think about it I'm like now when I'm at a, now when I'm at a festival and everybody has the same fast punk beat like yeah Eventually, I just my brain gets tired of oh, hearing sure. it. But when I'm 15, I see it as an outlet for that mosh pit energy. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, okay, the pit, the pit, the pit. Like life was a big endurance test, right? Of teenage drunkenness. So, um, yeah. So I I kind of like miss the days of that 90s rock pop, like Walmart section where Metallica was next to Hanson. Yeah, like, of course. There was really no. HMV at one point, the rap and metal section were on different floors. That right. is like, if that's not a metaphor, I don't know what is. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jason Rockman, and I'm here to talk to you about a really serious matter, hot sauce. There's nothing worse than trying a horrible hot sauce. And let's be honest, we've all tried some pretty bad ones. There's people all around the world that are suffering in silence, thinking that the hot sauce they have is the best that they're gonna get. But I've got some news for you. There's a solution and there's an answer. And that answer is Heartbeat Hot Sauce. Heartbeat Hot Sauce is probably the best hot sauce that you'll ever try in your entire life. It's changing lives one bottle at a time. Make a pledge right now below and buy your first bottle of Heartbeat Hot Sauce. If you use our promo code ROCKMAN20, you too will be helping somebody out there that has no idea what hot sauce really truly can taste like. Enrich somebody's life today. This message is brought to you by the Rockman Power Hour. 
Anyway, that being said, so rewinding all the way back to uh, that Edge Fest day, music was just music back then. Pretty and, much. And just a band's playing cool. Oh, yeah. they're, they're fast. But My mom might not like it. Great. That, that, that's, but then you go to Oceaga and you look at, you know, you look at how eclectic people are with their music taste and it's kind of cool. And that's yeah, what I think, is. I think what Oceaga has at the base of it whether you know the, all these people will bitch go oh it's not my Oceaga it's not a lineup for me but mm -hmm. the, the the spirit of Oceaga is discovering new music yeah and I think it always retains that yeah. but it takes a lot of young hungry programmers to keep that spirit alive of course because I think if you you know if you're gonna give me the budget and ask me to fucking book it you know it would reflect my taste but I think if you have a handful of bookers that all have different tastes and then you smorgasbord it all together that's where it gets interesting yeah, like, may I even give credit to our colleague at Comic-Con Cliff for booking cosplayers before it was cool. Uh, yeah. All these years ago, I was like, why the hell are they booking cosplayers? Like, you know, when I'm just going there as an attendee. Right. And now, cosplayers are arguably some of the most famous guests you can get at conventions. So. For sure. Yeah. Definitely. But you have, to, you have to think outside the box. Yeah. And I think that what's great about that festival is that they, they do think outside the box. And... You see these things that happen, um, you know, these cultural moments, like with Chapel Roan. Like, yeah, okay, maybe Chapel Roan's not a household name for someone my age or your age, but my daughter and her friends yeah. that went to that show, when they saw them, you know, everybody, you know, doing that, that dance to that song together, I mean, that was a moment for them, you know? Yeah. That was kind of like a moment for a lot of people at... Woodstock 99 when Fred Durst said break stuff and people were jumping and you know like it's these moments that happen in music yeah and they're special and when you're young and you are impressionable and that happens and you never forget that kind of stuff you Hell know no. um, speaking of never forgetting I can't believe I still can't remember the name of that fucking guy's band because I say it all the time but a band I do remember the first time I ever went to Warp Tour yeah and I remember meeting meeting and seeing a band called uh, The Deviates. And this guy, Charlie, we watched the set, and he had he looked really cool. He had green hair. And I just started asking him questions. And just being 15, like someone with sunglasses and green hair when you're like <laughs> fucking 15 and not used to it. Yeah, it's pretty You're like, cool. oh, my God. I'm, so ta cool. I'm talking to Zeus. Yeah. So uh, the bass player, Damien, he was great, too. And we ended up, I think they played twice that day. And it was just... It was really cool. It was really, it was really cool to just meet a band and see how it's done. And even though they're playing on a stage that was probably the size of a picnic table, it still to us was just like mind-numbingly cool. Oh yeah, I mean, listen, being spending time with, you know, with Our Lady Peace at the beginning. Yeah. Spending time with the tea party. That's why I still have relationships with those guys. Because See, to me, I discovered them through much music, through yeah. music videos. Hence, here are the music gods on the TV. Right. It doesn't matter if you're popular or yeah, not. No, if no, you're no. on television, oh my God, you're right. you're just as big as Metallica because you are on a video TV. on this yeah. channel. Yeah. I mean, Our Lady Peace ended up becoming one of the biggest bands in the 90s. Like, yeah. And same thing with Tea Party. And for, for us, they were just the guys that gave us a shot, you know? Yeah. Um, and it was nice to have that nice relationship with them and, and like the Tea Party were just such nice guys and That's... so were so were the OLP guys you know like that original Our Lady Peace lineup they were um, they were great guys and like you know Rain was a really really kind guy really liked our band wore our, I remember he wore our our, um, our shirt on Much Music when they went and did something and it meant so much to us we were like holy shit Rain's wearing our fucking Slaves on Dope shirt and He's just a nice guy, and he still is a nice guy, you know? He's the kind of guy you call him and he'll answer the phone, you know? It's Some, sometimes I detach myself by what I'm wearing sometimes. Right. But when you're wearing a friend's band's t-shirt, like, we take it for granted because there's the internet. Yeah. And with a picture of something, you'll get, like, potentially thousands of people you're seeing the thing. But back in the day, pre-internet, wearing a t-shirt Oh, was, man. You know, I, I only oh. found out... Like, we used to give Slaves on Dope shirts to bands all the time. Yeah. And I only recently found out through doing a, a Slaves on Dope search on Getty Images that we had given shirts to Faith No More in 1996 when we went to go see them in Toronto. Yeah. I think it was 95 or 96. <laughs> oh, shit. And the guitar player had worn our shirt on stage at a festival... Um, two days later and we have pictures of 
the guitar player Trace Bross, who was like one of the guitar players they had after their main guy left. Yeah. And he was wearing a Slaves on Dope shirt on stage, and we're like, oh my god, like, so. I know that when my band's name was brought up to Billy Gould when we did the covers yeah. for Kings of Quarantine, he knew who the band was. And I had already, you know, he knew the band's name was when I interviewed him when we were on Heavy. That, that when we were on Heavy in 2015, yeah. the same day as Faith No More, like, he knew who our band was. He knew the name. And it's because the name's been around him for years. Yeah. You know what I mean? Since like the early 90s. and. Probably so many people have told him over the years how much we always say we were influenced by him and this and that. So I know now that Billy knows how much that his band means to me, you know. Yeah. And the fact that I'm able to have like Facebook conversations with him still blows my mind, you know. Like when Wayne Kramer died yeah. from MC5, um, Susan Moss, the photographer from Montreal, had taken some photos of Wayne Kramer in. Um, in um, Montreal when he came through and his backing band was Billy Gould like from Faith No More yeah. he was one of his musicians and there's a great shot of Wayne and Billy and I got a copy of that like I bought a print from Susan and I'm framing it and I'm sending it to Billy because I sent them, him the shot I go check out the shot he goes oh my god because <laughs> that's because Wayne died and I said, I said my condolences and I go a friend of mine took the shot of you guys he goes oh my god it's a beautiful shot and I said well I'm getting it blown up and framed and sending it to you and he was like you don't have to do that I go I want to do that yeah because you've done so much for me over the years just being you you know so it's funny how things happen in life and they're full circle yeah well I feel that like for you when you met Rain you know oh yeah I remember when you telling him that his song meant all that to you yeah 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 so it's it's interesting how like what we hear versus what we read when it comes to lyrics. Yeah, well, yeah. That's... And it can mean so much to you, and it's just like, no, you're a, you're a vowel off, and it's a complete different yeah. meaning. But still, it's I guess it's just about feeling it, right? It's, I think so. Yeah. But, but it's interesting how sometimes we think what we do kind of doesn't matter. Not that it doesn't matter, but we can't see the impact it can have on people because... All we can see is how it was made. Yeah. Like the sausage it gets made. I'm sure there's albums where you remember how much it cost, how hard it was to get a track right, what, oh, yeah. what an amplifier blew up, all this stuff. You can't really appreciate the result with the clean, with the clean, uh, basically just with the fresh ear, clean perspective. All you can see is all the duct tape while someone else just sees the curtain and the light show. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Like, I can't listen to any music that I've made with a, you know, without ha having it under a microscope or without cringing. Yeah. Like, like I'll hear a note or something like that. I'll be like, oh, God, why are you saying Yeah, that? all that uh, stuff. I listen to stuff and I'm like, oh, God, fuck. But to someone else, they're like, oh, fuck, it's awesome. It's it's raw. Yeah, that note's a little off. It's great. Like, when I, that, a couple weeks ago, I posted that video of those kids empty shell casing. Yeah. It's a band from Texas that were covering Pushing Me. Um, and they shot a bunch of videos of them covering Pushing Me and it looked like they were playing like a, I don't know, like a skate park or something. There was all these kids and it was like super crazy energy, you know? Yeah. And there was all these people filming and, and it looked awesome, but they were covering one of my songs and it was like so weird to see these kids that were probably not even 20 covering Slaves on Dope. And, you know, like all these years later. Yeah. And then when Priya one day was on Spotify and she goes holy shit dad and I said what she goes Violet Grohl Dave Grohl's daughter has your song on her playlist wow I was like what she's she, got good taste though she got him into the misfits too well she got she had um, she had pushing me on her playlist and I was like holy shit that's fucking rad yeah so it's very possible that one day she was in the car with her dad with her playlist on he was like who the fuck's this <laughs> she's like oh this is the band you know like so you never know you never know. Yeah. You never know. Which goes to show it's the same reason why, like, when promoting anything, you shouldn't really ignore any particular social media app. No. Because that might be the one window. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, I mean, when I saw Denzel Curry at Oceaga last week, and he shows up, and he was so guarded by everybody pre-festival. Yeah. Like, yeah. his PR people were like, oh, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do this. And, like... He was only doing three interviews, and then when he showed up to the media tent, 
I remember going, oh, Denzel's here. He's doing interviews. And there were people were like, oh, yeah, but he's only talking to the festival and, like, one other outlet. And then he finishes his interview and he gets up and he's like, all right, who's next? Which, who's waiting? Who's, I'll talk to anybody. And it was like, and I remember his handler looked at him and said, hey, man, like, you're only supposed to be three. And he looked at me and said, yeah, but I want to talk to everybody because I'm here to promote. Yeah. And I was just like, okay, this guy gets it. Yeah, your, obscure, your obscurity in an internet-led world is not really going to get you anywhere. Like, wow, you're really cool. You're playing for, like, five people in your parents' basement. Well, guess what? That's all you'll ever do. Like, Well, and I think sometimes with when you're an artist, especially, like, because, you know, he was, he's getting pretty popular. And, yeah. and I think what ends up happening is a lot of people, like, you know, they have these, they have handlers and they have people around them that keep them insulated. And sometimes they're the ones making the decisions for them and saying, you shouldn't do that. Oh, yeah, you should just do this. And they're, like, they're trying to guide them. They're, they're trying to do a service to them yeah. by, you know, telling them who they should talk to. But sometimes it's a disservice. I agree. But there's a two-edged sword there. It's like sometimes you want to talk to an outlet that will, you know, that's a legit outlet sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, if you're on too many outlets that aren't legit outlets, maybe it'll devalue you in some kind of way. Yeah, some people are, that you know, really depends. But, and, but uh, that's also bullshit too. Yeah. That, that, you know, it's, it can't hurt to get a new fan somewhere. I don't think so. I mean, I've never been, I've never been one to now, turn now, down. Yeah. Know, like, although I, I've gotten some, inf- I've gotten some invites. Like if I have a friend that has a podcast yeah. and they're friends and they're starting something out and they invite me on, I go do it. Sure. Don't care how many views they've had. If they're, especially oh, if I know, I don't, oh no, I, right. I don't give a. But shit. I have had people in the city that have invited me to go on their podcast, where I've looked at them, their content, I've looked at what they do, and I'm like, I don't know if I really want to spend an hour there, because I just don't think that's for me. Gotcha. And it's not a snob thing. It's more it, like it, it's got to really be something that is off-putting for me to say no. Yeah, I got. Gotcha. And there was one outlet in particular that invited me and I looked at it and I was like yeah I don't know if they're inviting me because they care about what I do or they just are looking to have interesting people on like who knows you know what I mean it just it it left a bit of a spidey sense tingle in me yeah I was just like I don't want to do that well also you're like you're in a world of clickbait and uh, you know sketchy editing sometimes they can edit something in a way that will make it sound like you're saying something else like I personally Every person that's ever been on one of my shows in the last, like, 15 years, I usually always have the, their benefit in mind. Well, yeah, I'm like, I want them to look as good as possible. Of There's course. ums and buts and sometimes senior moments or sometimes someone will make an off-color joke. I cut it out yeah. because I'm just like, why, why condemn them? Right. Like, they're, no, no, of they're, course. They're literally trusting me with recording them. I'm not going to fuck them over. Right. I'm not TMZ. Yeah. You don't want to look for the soundbite all the time. No, and I'm kind of disgusted with the idea of the soundbite because I used to just like stuff not because of its soundbite. And uh, whatever band I got into it used to be because I liked the music, not because, like, you know, not not just because, oh, I heard they broke a hotel room. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. No, and I think sometimes we have guests that not everybody will understand or, un- like, you know, but when I say yes to have someone on the podcast... It's usually for the reason of either a, you know, they're they're doing something interesting. Someone recommends them to us, and then, you know, but but I won't just I won't just say yes for the sake of saying yes. Like it's got to there's got to be something there that I think is interesting. I agree. And for you too, or if you come to me and say, hey, I think we should really talk to these people, and I'm a little hesitant. Sometimes I'll be like, ah, oh, you know what, I'm going to do it because you you feel that it's important, and then it ends up being good. So one thing I won't do though is I don't say a movie's good when it's not. That's one. That's I just won't one, talk about it. That's one thing. I would rather just not talk about it. Yeah. But once upon a time, I received a DVD and a rock star produced it, and uh, I was like, oh, man, this is the worst movie I've ever seen. Yeah. And I was a little, you know, this is a while ago, but I was a little troubled about, like, what do I do? Like, I owe them a review, but I really don't think they want it. Yeah. Well, I think that's the thing, right? Like, sometimes... You have to make a decision if you're going to be a journalist and you're going to be a reviewer. Um, are you going to be that kind? Like, what kind of journalist do you want to be? Do you want to be a critic or do you want to be a commentator? Yeah. 
like I would rather comment on stuff than critique it. Yeah. Because critiquing it insinuates that I can do a better job or that I'm versed in that. Like yeah. if you're an art critic or a film critic, usually it would mean you've gotten to that level of being able to critique it because you've worked in that milieu before or you know enough about it that you are deemed a critic. Yeah. And I think I don't look at myself as that. I'm a fan. But it's also like when someone like says, um, you know, they don't they don't watch the movie. They see the trailer and they right. make their decisions or they're looking at an influencer or a blogger that they like and they said it sucks, so therefore it sucks. Yeah. Or they're shitting on a show and they only saw the first two episodes yeah. and there's 10 episodes. It's like you can't say an album sucks if you don't like the first three songs. No, you have to give it give it a chance. And, and the thing is, no one gives... A lot of people don't give stuff a chance anymore. No. They just go, you know, like, for example, Trap. I went to go see Trap with my daughter. Oh, I really want to see it. Like, so I saw it. Um, I went in saying, oh, I don't want to see this. I've read some really bad reviews. A couple of people are... Like, the rumor, the vibe around it is that it's a mess. Um, I went, and... I enjoyed it, had a good time. Yeah. Did I think some of it was a mess? There were moments where it was a little messy, but M. Night Shyamalan has had a fucking messy career to begin with. Yeah. But I like him, I like some of his ideas, you know? But sometimes movies, what people consider a mess, I kinda like, but yeah. But also movies, I think they're total shit. People I really, truly respect, Yeah. they, they fucking love them. They love them, they champion them, and uh, you yeah, know, it's just kind of like we're we're not we're not you can't all put us in a box. No. And that's the unique thing about human beings is we're not all supposed to like the same stuff. That's for pod people. It's like yeah, well it's like Fantasia, like I'll go sometimes and I'll see stuff and everyone's hyped about it. And I think Fantasia is the perfect example of you know, there's gonna be stuff that you're just not gonna enjoy. Yeah. But but what's great is you have people there that are willing to go outside the box and willing to take a chance on stuff and willing to say hey I you know I didn't I might not have liked that but I appreciate certain things about it yeah and, and, people, and people showing up for these potential wastes of time or potential masterpieces the people who show up to it regardless like that's how art continues well and I also yeah. realize with Fantasia one of the reasons why I think a lot of these screenings sell out is that for some of these movies they're not going to come out for another year. Oh, yeah. You're going to be the first people to see them. You might see a version of this movie that doesn't ever exist again because they chop it up. Yeah. Or you might be seeing this movie um, and it comes out the next week and you're still you're seeing it premiere, you know? So it's a, bit, it's a mixed bag. But, like, I look at... Um, I forget what movie it was. I always forget the name of it, but I loved it. And there's always a couple of movies that I see at Fantasia that I just adore. Yeah, um, and we saw one a couple years ago. I don't know if you came to it with me. It was about that guy. I think it was with Nicholas Holt, not Nicholas Holt, but it was with this actor. It's about that chef that gets hired. Yeah, yeah. I saw. No, I told you to see it. Yeah, Marco and I. I saw it. it was, Marco and I saw it. I'm like, and we Jason, interviewed, we interviewed the director. You have to fucking see this movie. So, do you remember the name of it? Oh shit. Yeah, I'm sorry. So I don't remember. I uh, it's it's got one of those names, unfortunately, that doesn't like you know ring out right but the movie was amazing amazing and it just they and the direct they just announced that they're putting it on blu-ray and i'm gonna buy it for oh, sure shit. it's been a long time <laughs> right yeah but you know i that movie to me was incredible mm -hmm. but that is another example of a movie that just kind of fell through the cracks and if more people saw that movie they would be like holy shit this movie's just it's it's great it's amazing you know? Yeah, there's a movie, and once again, I'm like spacing on the name right now, but it's about these two guys who are best friends, and uh, they kidnap their boss's daughter and shit, and it's like a comedy, and it's really funny, it was yeah. really amazing, super low budget, and uh, I've never heard of it again. Right. Or there's another one called Zero Charisma about these guys who are really into their D&D &D game, and there's this one particular comic book guy type guy who's like their leader. Yeah. And they meet like a cooler geek who's in the shit, and he has them at his party, and just the guy has like a breakdown. It's really fucking interesting. It's called Zero Charisma. Okay. And uh, yeah, yeah. So there are movies that I have to kind of think, because when you see 20 movies a year, you're not going to remember. Yeah, no, I one. know, I know. 
but there are some that are just so special. Yeah, like that movie Femme. Like, I like that movie so much. Oh, me too, yeah. And I bought it. Vinegar Syndrome put it out. And actually, I got it. It showed up at my house, like, the day that Fantasia was starting. Oh, no way. And I was like, oh, that's ironic. Like, a year ago, I saw this movie, and we interviewed the director. And so, going back to, like, content and caring about content. Like, I don't care. Unfortunately, maybe it's to our detriment, but I don't care. I don't... I, I, I don't care about how well the content does I care about how well the content's created yeah same here and if the content's created well and it's interesting and, we, and, and it's comes from the heart then that's all you can do and it'll eventually find its audience kind of like you know a Slaves on Dope song finds its audience 25 years later yeah. through you know sheer will of people just wanting to like listen to the song it like resonates well you could also hear it in a band that if every song is like chasing radio like there's a difference between yeah. a song is so fucking good it's gonna get on radio yeah versus there is no originality in this song whatsoever yeah this is a carbon copy of this song that already exists yeah there's it's form formula yeah formulaic rock yeah formulaic make... yeah i can't pronounce words but formulaic there's, it's there, hard there's <laughs> a there's a big difference between people who just write exceptionally good songs that happen to be played a lot on the radio and people who are just chasing the grail. Like, they are chasing it so hard that all authenticity is gone. And you could always hear that. I remember there was this, he used to be this booker. Um, he was Canadian, but he ended up going to the U.S. and he became a really, really um, influential, influential um, booking agent. His name was Dave Kirby. Yeah. And he died. Um, but I remember we met with Dave Kirby and he was friends with a guy that managed us named Michael White, who was also a Canadian. And he, Dave Kirby became our agent. Um, and Andrew Goodfriend was the junior agent who worked with Dave. And I remember Dave, his advice was for a band, he goes, when in doubt, go heavy. <laughs> and it was funny because he was kind of right. Like, especially in metal and in and hard rock, like, if you're ever doubting what direction you're going in, like, just be a little heavier and you'll find your audience because there's always an audience for that, you know, rather than chase the single. Yeah. It was just interesting, an interesting take because I think other people would say, like, well, no, you should really hone your songwriting and write the hook. And, and I still, I'm, I'm a believer of that. I'm all, I'm all about hooks, but I see bands... Like even AFI, AFI of this album Black Cells in the Sunset. Yeah. And we uh, had this 40th birthday party for uh, one of my best buds. And we were playing it on vinyl. We got a Illinois show to Illinois. And uh, we're playing this album and I'm listening to it. And I'm like, you know, there's no hit single off this album. But right. Every single one of these fucking songs is great. Yeah. Yeah. And they're fast and they're crazy. And my mom would probably be like, oh my God, shut this off. But it, but I'm saying in the punk world, every song had a hook. Every song kind of, every, they gave a shit about every song and you can tell. Yeah. So yeah, there's, I guess it's kind of hard. Like, you know, there's, okay, what's a great album? Like Appetite for Destruction is fucking undeniable. Yeah. I guess the, the worst song on it is technically my way your way anything goes tonight like if you want to have a bad song on it but it's not bad right if you drop it on any other hair rock metal album you're like wow we're lucky to have this song right but in comparison to the greatness of appetite for destruction if you have to have a weak link i guess it's that and you know night train was never a single really but it's fucking am it's, it's fucking song. amazing so is mr brown's yeah. song yeah yeah they're all amazing. They're yeah. undeniably well-written songs that radio could not ignore, and that's kind of what happened. Yeah. Same thing with Molly Crew. Molly Crew wrote great songs. Shout the Devil. They're great songs. So, I don't know. I've heard I've heard also songs on the radio that I think kind of suck from a songwriting perspective, but they're well produced and they were kind of made to live in that world. Well, then when you go to the U.S., there's that active rock market, which is just bands you know a lot of bands like bands like a band like flat black yeah it's very much active rock so there's stations that you know there's these bands that have this whole scene that 
it's all on radio hits and they'll play, you know, they'll go and they'll play shows and sometimes, you know, they'll be popular in a market because they have radio play, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily have a fan base, you know, so you need a bit of both. Yeah. You need to have that underground fan base that comes to see you, that loves you, and then having a, a hit really helps, you know? Because you can always tell when a band plays a hit in a market where they're getting radio or they were getting that kind of support. Yeah. It's probably different now, but when a band has a song that people know, you see the difference if, in the market that's gotten where it gets mainstream support. I got or at you. least that's how it was traditionally, you know? Yeah. Well, radio radio to me was this mythical thing and this is a whole other conversation because you know you've seen the insides and outsides of it yeah but radio to me growing up was like i saw the movie airheads at a very impressionable age where people were willing to like literally break in yeah take just over. to get their to take over a radio station and go to prison just so they could have their song played on a radio because that's how important playing a song on a radio once was. Oh, yeah. And you do hear this. Like, Bon Jovi would not have a career had it not been for this one DJ that played them constantly. Same thing with Buddy Holly and the Crickets. One DJ played their song constantly. Yep. Having that kind of, you know, and having that kind of influence, being able to do that. Um, Kiss, Destroyer wasn't really making any noise. And yeah. uh, one radio station, they, put, they flipped the single, they started playing Beth, and boom. I think Faith and War were on the real thing. They had been touring that album for 18 months. Wow. 16 months. Shit. Until Epic broke. And then when Epic broke at radio and on MTV, that was it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it was like, they just became huge, massive. Then they got this huge budget to do Angel Dust. Yeah. And then instead of trying to write the follow up to Epic and to the real thing, they put out the most bizarre fucking record. Yeah. and tank their career but yeah. that album now is heralded as one of the greatest records you know ever yeah well when you think about The Clash too like The Clash with London Calling yeah I just got that album from um, Lenoy shout out to Lenoy's and uh, I remember even when I was a kid when I was a shitty teenager who just wanted everything fast and loud and you know to match my teenage angst uh, I couldn't appreciate London Calling until I was in my 20s right and I can only listen to the first two Clash albums because they're the fast ones, you know? No right. disco for me. Right. Uh, so, you know, re-listening to it now just with my 40-year-old musical brain that just can appreciate almost anything. You ever listen to Big Big Audio Dynamite? No. You know what that is? No, I don't. It's a, one of the members of the Clash started a band after with some... It was like a reggae kind of almost dancey okay. influence. It's fucking amazing. All right, yeah. I got I got to check that out. It's yeah. it's it's either Mick or Paul. Probably, I doubt uh, it's Topper or Joe. No, it was Joe. Joe, okay. Just drummer. I'm pretty okay. sure it's Joe. Okay. I don't want to say that, but yeah. So Joe um, Strummer started a few bands, but he was uh yeah. I think he was in Big Audio Dynamite. I'm pretty sure it's Joe Strummer. Don't incredible. quote me, but incredible talent. Anyway, so I'm listening to um, how diverse all the songs are, and the interesting thing it's a double album. And you got like four songs on one side, then five, four, all these little bunches. Right. And now that I have to kind of stop what I'm doing and go flip the record over, now in my brain, I, I see them as little, little chapters. Right. Instead of a big, long CD that out of principle I wouldn't skip because my old drummer from Rockets Way, Mark Andre, says, with his French accent, hey, if you can't uh, listen to an album without skipping, it means it's not a good album. Right. So... That, that does not sound like you, Mark, if you hear this. But anyway, um, I remember I remember this is the first time ever where there's literally an obligatory pause. And I'm like, you know, songs I thought that weren't good, even though there's only two songs that, you know, they could have, like, left off, but they're still full of saxophone and piano. They're very cool songs. Yeah. Time was spent on them. Just to me, I'm like, ah, you know, they're just not as fucking amazingly epic as the other ones I listen to them now in these batches and I'm like no they're fine they're great they belong of course they belong so I'm like I, I had the most unique listening experience today of London Calling and I'm like I've been listening to the fucking album for like 20 years and just still discover new things about it just through different ways of listening and the, you know we're gonna blow up vinyl a lot on this podcast but uh just hearing all the little intricacies on the hi-hat 
and what he's doing on the base, you really can really appreciate a tight base player on vinyl. I think that's the most thing. Yeah, it's a bit more bottom end for sure. Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, thanks for listening to that. <laughs> this is the first time we've ever gone on a road trip. We have conversations like this all the time, which is never record them. No, it's true. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's... A lot that. of times you don't want to record them because it can get canceled. Oh, yeah. 